Okay, the number is starting to slow down, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone again to today's question and answer panel with Lund University alumni. My name is Audrey Savage, and I'm an International Communications Officer here in the International Marketing and Recruitment Office at Lund, and I'll be moderating the panel today. I'm also uh, an alumna of Lund myself. I graduated uh, a couple years ago from the Masters of Applied Cultural Analysis, so it's really nice to be here today with so many of our other alumni. Uh, so uh, first, perhaps we could go around and also introduce ourselves. So if everyone could share uh, your name, where you're from, or maybe where you are now, uh, what you studied at Lund, and and what you do now. Uh, so maybe we'll start with Cynthia. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Cynthia, currently living in Indonesia. Uh, I graduated from Food Technology and Nutrition 2020 and then currently living in Indonesia and will pursue my PhD in education next year in New Zealand. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Alexa. Yes, hello. So I'm Alexa, originally from the US and currently living and working in Denmark. Um, and I studied the public health program at Lund for my master's, graduated just last year in 2021. Um, and currently I'm working for a medical device company here in Copenhagen called 3Shape. Hey, thank you. Kevin. Oh, you're muted, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I'm Kevin, I'm originally from Colombia, and I'm working in the US for Siemens USA, uh, particularly in the business unit of e-mobility. Great, and what did you study at Lynn? Oh yeah, I did study, I did a master's on entrepreneurship and innovation. Wonderful, thank you. Renee. Hello, I'm Renee, uh, originally from the US and living in Malmö, Sweden for the last seven years. I did my master's in the same as Audrey, Applied Cultural Analysis, and I'm currently working as a UX researcher for a design, design agency called Above. Great. And last but not least, Dom John. Hello, everyone. My name is Damian. I uh, graduated from the European Law uh, European Business Law Program at Lund University in 2017. Uh, since then, I've been working as a lawyer, and recently I started working. So I'm originally from North Macedonia, but currently I'm in Brussels, and I'm working for the European Commission as a as a lawyer. Okay, wonderful. So we have a really great mix here, folks who studied all different faculties, people who graduated quite recently or perhaps a bit ago and are a bit more advanced in their career. Uh, so before we jump right into some questions, I want to give a couple logistical notes to the audience that, of course, we have a Q&A uh, feature in the bottom of the screen where you can post any questions you have for our alumni and we'll take them as we go. There's also a little thumbs up feature that if someone has already posted the same question that you have, you can give it a little thumbs up and it will kick it to the top of the list so that we make sure that we we answer that. Uh, and otherwise, uh, since we are here today with uh, our alumni, we want to make sure that we use our time wisely and focus on, on them and their experiences. So if you have any questions about the application or scholarships or any of those kind of processes, it's better if you join some of our webinars that are happening tomorrow, where we will go fully through the full application process with staff and go through all those questions. So today we're going to keep focused just on questions about our alumni's experience, both their time at Lund and, and what they're up to now. Uh, so first, I want to jump right in and actually ask uh, for everyone, uh, why did you choose Lund in the first place? And, and kind of what was your thought process behind deciding to come to Sweden since everyone kind of came from such faraway places? Perhaps we'll go around kind of uh, the opposite way then and we'll start back with you, Damian. Okay, so I chose the European uh, Business Law Program. Uh, firstly, because I mean, it's specific for lawyers because we need certain amount of European credits, the educational credits to qualify to be eligible for the bar exam. So I was looking for a program that lasted for two years, which the European uh, business law program did. So that was my first criteria. I'm searching for a two years uh, master's program. Secondly, I was looking for something in English and uh, it was in English. So that was the second criteria which had to be fulfilled. Uh, and of course it had to be one of the top 100 universities in the world, or 200 at least. Uh, so basically that was it. And uh, it fulfilled all the criteria. Uh, 
on top i got a scholarship for it so it was for free basically uh so yeah uh more or less that was it of course i had a look at the at the teachers the professors who taught at the uh, program and i was really impressed by by the syllabus and by everything so uh, that was also the international atmosphere uh since it's one of the most international universities in europe uh we have a lot of diversity which was really important for me uh and uh yeah i think more or less that's it yeah wonderful i mean uh, with a scholarship you can never go wrong <laughs> definitely great renee what about you what brought you uh, from the us to sweden uh I can give a politically correct answer, which is lots of English programs, and I really like the master's program, uh, but the non-politically correct and the more truthful answer is I just wanted to do a master's program in Europe, uh, and there was a few programs that I was looking at, but I liked Lund the best because um, a lot of the English programs, you move around, they're like Erasmus kind of structures, and I wanted to be a little bit more staying in place. Uh, and so Lund was great for that. So English and like a stable place as opposed to a lot of moves. Definitely. Kevin, how about you? Um, yeah, well, I choose Lund maybe uh, because of the connection between different industries that are in the area, not, not only in Sweden, but also in Denmark. And the whole region was interesting for me. And um, also the, the background in research was one of the main things that attracted me to, to Lund. Uh, so yeah, at the end, I, I kind of pick a, a couple of universities in Sweden, but uh, Lund was on the top of the list because of the research. Absolutely. And that's something hopefully we're going to dive into a lot today is kind of like what, what experiences you got that, that you're using now in your career. Great. Alexa, what about you? Yeah, um, so during my bachelor's, I studied abroad in, in Denmark, um, and since I studied public health, it's uh, quite different here in Scandinavia than it is in the US, as you guys probably know, so it was a completely new experience for me, and then after studying abroad here, I, I just fell in love um, with Scandinavia, so I decided, you know, as I pursued my master's, I wanted it to be somewhere in Scandinavia, um, and then Lund was an easy choice. The public health program that we have in Lund is one of the, the most renowned. It's a really well-known one. Um, um, the year I applied or the year before, actually, it was the most applied to English speaking master's program in Sweden. So I thought it was super impressive. Um, and as I read more, it seemed, you know, that I liked that it had a broad uh, range of topics. A lot of the public health programs that I saw uh, focused on very specific things, but I didn't feel it was a well-rounded kind of overview. Um, so Loon checked all the boxes. Um, and like Damien, I was pretty lucky to get a scholarship since as an American, I pay out of pocket. So the LU Global Scholarship. Uh, made the final decision for me um, and it was quite easy. So a lot of little things together, but I think generally, you know, out of all of Scandinavia and Europe, I think you can't go wrong with Lund. Wonderful, thank you. And Cynthia, what brought you all the way from Indonesia? Well, uh, Lund is top 100 ranked university in the world, also part of the scholarship. Uh, I got two different scholarships at a time. So it's part of LPDP from my uni uh, from my country and also global scholarship. And the other one is also, uh, also Kevin mentioned about that the collaboration between industry and the university is quite strong. I still remember that a lot of startup developed in Lund University. So that's one good point if you want to sharpen the uh, the sharp, uh, uh, how to start the new entrepreneur program or whatever. I think Lund University is the best choice how to start with. Great, thank you. And I want to just go ahead and already dive really deep into that. So in terms of uh, the careers that you're having now and the work that do you do, how do you feel that your education at Lund uh, prepared you or played a role in achieving the success that you have now in your career? So maybe I'll start in the middle this time and we'll start with Kevin. Uh, well, from my side, it was really, really good to have some kind of experience in Europe because I, I came from Latin America and uh, in Lund, I had the opportunity to do like a short internship. Uh, so that was very helpful now that I'm working for a European company, even if it's in the US. Uh, a lot of the culture and uh, how people work inside the organization is very European focused. So that was very helpful. And also having in mind all the... This will, will sound a little bit nerdy, but uh, 
definitely the articles that, and all the papers that I read uh, during the masters right now are very important for, for my work and also to move around inside the organization. So yeah, definitely very helpful to all the, all the insights that I get from the, from the masters. Definitely. I think that's always great to hear that, that the readings you're doing, not just the lectures and what you're learning really, you know, communicating in the classes, but the readings are also being really useful uh, in your future work. So that's great to hear. Wonderful. Renee, how about you? Yeah, I think that uh, like coming from the U.S., the Swedish education system is set up totally different. Um, they're both great experiences. I did my bachelor's in the U.S. and that was great. But my master's is very much like um, there's like a strong sense of autonomy. Uh, in the Swedish education system, it's kind of like we trust you to like put yourself through your education and like uh, there's a support system if you need it, but ultimately like we trust you to kind of get yourself from point A to point B. And I think that the Swedish work sector, at least um, like in the design field is very similar. So you have quite a lot of responsibility and autonomy, even if you're in a more junior position. Um, there's quite a lot of trust there for you to be able to kind of carry out your work duties without having like someone peeking over your shoulder or telling you what to do. And so I think that like having that educational experience transferred quite well into the work for workforce. Definitely. Thank you. Damian. Yes, for me, I think it, it would not be an understatement if I said that it played a crucial role. Because what I'm doing now is basically I'm, I'm involved in the application of European law uh, within the Commission. And what I studied at Lund was European law. So basically, I'm applying what I studied for. And I think just uh, graduating from Lund University played a really important role. Not just the fact that I graduated, but also the fact that I got involved into many of the activities which were offered. So it's up to everyone, up to every student to get involved into every activity that is offered. So it's not enough that you simply graduate. It's important that you get involved into everything. Uh, for me, the biggest, my biggest involvement was the participation in the European Law Moot Court competition, which is kind of the, the top thing to do when you're in this program, in the, in the law, in the Faculty of Law. And I strongly recommend if there is anyone from the uh, Faculty of Law listening now, to try to apply for the European Law Moot Court because it's really a uh, professional and a personal experience, uh, which really makes you stand out from um, from the other applicants for, for a job, uh, let's say. So yes, I also wrote an article for the for the student law review, like a student journal, which is also makes you makes you stand out from the others. So uh, Lund offers you many opportunities, and it's up to you to use them. And using them will make you really uh, distinguish and stand out from the rest of the applicants for a job. So for me, I think it really played a crucial role, but also my involvement in the activities offered by the university really uh, helped me uh, in my professional and personal life. Absolutely. I think that's some really great advice. It's definitely all what you make of it. And you have to really take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, for anyone who actually missed our previous webinar just a half an hour ago, we had an hour and a half uh, chat with different current students who are taking advantage of internships and research and study abroad and things. So I definitely would encourage our audience, if you missed that, to go online in the next day or two. Uh, the recording will be up and really learn more about those opportunities so that you can take advantage of those for sure. Great. Alexa, what about you as someone who graduated quite recently? Uh, how have you found that your, your experience in studies has bled over into your career? Uh, thankfully, I can say it has. Uh, so that's a good start. I think I can echo a lot of the same sentiments that Renee said. Um, coming as an American, I think it was quite different, the, the autonomy we were given. So the independence and proactivity that I've learned has been super helpful. And right now, I'm currently in a graduate program. So essentially, it's a two-year program where I do three different rotations in different parts of the company. Um, and when I was hired, I told them, you know, I, I'm not uh, somebody who knows much about medical devices. I'm not somebody who can software develop. I'm not somebody who's an engineer. I'm also not somebody who did any sort of business or commercial kind of understanding. So I'm not a finance person. Um, 
but as I was talking to them more, um, I kind of got to see what skills I had to apply. And I think specifically within the public health program, you learn a lot of research um, skills, which I think is super applicable. Um, probably Renee feels that as well working in UX. I mean, you have to understand the, the users um, or the people that you're working with, what you're creating products or designs or whatever for. So I think the research skills I've learned have also been super applicable in roles that I wouldn't necessarily foresee in the first place. Um, but I think the really unique thing about Lund as well is just how many international students there are. You get a very global perspective and you learn a lot of cross-cultural communication um, from attending Lund. And I think that was a huge asset for me coming into the workplace to say, you know, I've worked with people from different backgrounds and different experiences in different countries. And um, so it made it really easy coming into an international environment because I already had those skills before. So I think that's been a huge plus from Lund as well. Sure, thank you. And Cynthia, as someone going on into a PhD, how have you found that your studies have kind of started to prepare you for a career in academia? I know that's something that quite a lot of students are very interested in continuing on uh, for PhD studies, so we'd love to hear about that. Okay, so well, uh, in the university, uh, I know that a lot of group projects that we need to work uh, in a, people from different background, education, and it helps me like how we work uh, in a multicultural and also international environment and for the PhD itself even though it's quite far New Zealand they asked me about the experience whether I've been working with different background or with people from different team and etc so it helps me a lot and how we work under the project a lot of group project will be assigned when you are studying in Lund I still remember almost every course requires us to do some project presentation and like huge projects so it helps me a lot and I do remember that I took some courses that in collaboration with the, with the industry. So they will invite a lot of people from like a TED Trapak, sorry to mention like also another company in the Sweden as well. So it can be like a open doors for you guys if you want to continue for master thesis or internship and whatever. So it helps me. And the PhD position that I apply is also industrial PhD. So it's very related with what I've done, the course I took uh, there in science, for example. Also, I conduct a thesis in a, such big company in Lund University, got an opportunity to do a uh, professional work for 10 months in Sweden before I, I left Sweden as well. So I think the, the education design in Sweden itself is also help us to work in a inter international environment and also global uh, needs as well, like a kind of multinational company. Maybe it helps. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. And we have, uh, in a way, kind of tying in a, a question here from the audience, uh, who is uh, Claire saying she's a non-EU student. So obviously there's more hoops to jump through when studying in Europe and is wondering if anyone has found that having a degree from an EU country has created more hoops for you to jump through in terms of when you look for jobs or PhDs in order to prove that the program was in English or was that a strength uh, that you studied in Europe? Uh, so I will leave that open, basically, if anyone would like to to share. I know, Damian, you were nodding a bit, so maybe you have something you'd like to to add there. Yeah, yeah, of, of course, it's a, it's a big advantage, especially because for me, I decided to return back to my country after graduating and having a degree from an EU country really is, is really a big benefit or really advantage when you apply for job applications, especially if you apply in, let's say, international organizations or, you know, somewhere where uh, international experience is really appreciated. So, yes, definitely it, it just opens the door for you back in your country, but also in, in Europe. So it's, it's really, I think it's a, it's a good situation for us um, because I'm, I'm coming from a non-EU country as well. So, yes, I would say that it's, uh, it really opens doors. Uh, and it's, it, of course, it's up to you to use it and to know where to use it, because not many people, some people will not appreciate, would appreciate having a local knowledge uh, instead of having international skills, international knowledge. So it also depends on where, where you apply. But in, from my experience, most of the places, having a degree from a new country is really an, an advantage, both outside the EU and inside the EU. Wonderful. Thank you. And Alexa, something to add there? 
Um, I have a bit of a different spin, I think. Um, and I think it's kind of important to keep in mind, particularly, you know, I hadn't really been abroad that much when I was uh, living in the US. And then this was the first time that I'd really moved somewhere else. There's certainly paperwork involved both ways, which you kind of have to keep on top of. Um, I was considering going back to the US to, to work in public health fields, um, which required some different accreditations. And admittedly, when I was going through the process to understand what was required, certainly Lund University wasn't on the short list of accredited universities from the US, um, but it was doable. I mean, it's such a globalized world nowadays that I think a lot of people are understanding that having an international background is an asset, so they're not trying to make it more difficult for you. Um, it might come across as more difficult sometimes, but it's doable. Certainly, there's no, no bars, I think is the best way to put it. But I'm not going to lie and say that there's not a couple hoops to jump through. Um, but as long as you're proactive about it and it's something you really want, I'm sure there's definitely a way to do it. I mean, I was able to have a back and forth conversation. And at the end of the day, they said, you know, as long as I could prove it in different ways in what I had studied, then it was it was fine to have my degree, uh, even if it wasn't from an accredited university in the US. So just keep in mind, um, certainly if you decide to, to move abroad and pursue a, a degree in Europe, if you're not from the EU um, and you decide to come back, you will probably have a couple extra things to do. But in my experience and uh, kind of personally, just from my time at Lund and um, thinking about going back to the US, for me, it was all worth it. I didn't mind the extra paperwork and things because of the experience that I had here. Uh, it made it certainly worthwhile. And even then, uh, because of the international experience, I think that you're a pretty desired applicant. So people will work with you to, to make different things happen. Yeah. Uh, as a new Swedish citizen, so I've been in it for a while, um, just to kind of give the perspective of if you are not an EU citizen uh, and you are maybe even just vaguely thinking that you might want to stick around in Sweden um, after your program, I think that uh, there's definitely some like avenues and some viable pathways forward after you study but I would highly recommend from pre like from my personal experience like if there's even a vague inclination that you'd be interested in staying start putting in the legwork now um both in terms of understanding the paperwork and kind of the process with the migration board um your study years don't count towards your like settlement time so figuring that all out kind of before um you've graduated is a really good like kind of helpful step um and i think also like networking so then you might have like some viable pathway forward is also really helpful and like i i can't stress how much learning swedish has actually made my life just so much easier post graduation so um i think that you know especially if you study at lund and you plan on staying in sweden Swedish employers are going to be very familiar with the university. So there's definitely like doors open for you, but it will make your life a lot easier in the long run if you start to plan ahead for that kind of now. I think one of the, the big advice that we always give from our office is that, of course, if you're coming just for studies, you could get by completely with English forever. But if you want to stay or you want to even kind of integrate more with the culture, starting to learn Swedish is definitely a big recommendation, but particularly when it comes to jobs. Uh, so I'd actually like uh, to kind of piggyback off that and, and talk a little bit about um, some of you have kind of stayed in the local area and been working in Sweden. Uh, Renee and, and Alexa, you're quite close uh, in Copenhagen, <laughs> in Denmark. Uh, and then we have some folks who've gone to other countries like Tamian, you're now in Brussels, uh, correct? And uh, Cynthia and Kevin went back home, I believe, to Indonesia and, and Colombia. So kind of uh, what played a role in that decision to either decide to uh, study, to stay in Sweden, sorry, after studies and work uh, locally or work within the EU or, or go back home? So maybe we can uh, kind of do a little roundtable about that as well. So uh, we can start with Cynthia. Yes. So uh, at the at the time, I chose to go back to Indonesia just for actually because I need to do some wedding preparation, etc. Then, but I got an opportunity to do ten months of working experience in Sweden. So for me, uh, all of the loan thingies like helps helps me a lot. Into including when I need to apply for a PhD, I would like to mention that. Uh, Sweden is considered as medium speaking English country, so I don't need to 
uh, to put English requirement, uh, I can skip that, that step for the application. So it's really helpful. But then I choose to pursue my PhD, then I plan maybe one day I can go back. So that is the simple plan. Great, yeah. And Kevin, what about you? Uh, what, what played a role in the decision to, uh, to go back to Columbia? Yeah, definitely was the pandemic. That was the, the big topic at the time. Uh, so I had to decide between taking those uh, humanitarian flights. And at the end, uh, I decided to, to go back. And, um, and also I felt that um, I wanted to go back to my country and kind of give something uh, back. Uh, and also I was more into, into reading and uh, at the end I, I felt and I also saw like that an opportunity in the US uh, because I, I, I thought that uh, was the place where a huge innovation will come and uh, a lot of jobs will, will be created uh, in the future, especially in that particular time of the, of the world where there's a lot of crisis. So that was my, my overall thought. That's what I would decide to, to go back to Colombia and then to move to the US. Uh, yes, of course. Sorry, you did say you're, you're working in the US now. That's great. Uh, but yes, I think it's, it's really something that, well, first of all, the pandemic uh, really kind of was a, a very difficult time for everyone and kind of deciding, especially in, in 2020, where to go and what. But um, it's always really uh, wonderful to see kind of the divide of we have quite a lot of students that do uh, take kind of their education and, and go back to their home countries for work and really uh, utilize that education there. We have people who stay around. Uh, Renee, you've uh, quite committed now <laughs> with uh, with getting Swedish citizenship. Congratulations. So what played part of the role in the decision not to go back home, but rather to stay in Sweden? I don't have a good answer for this. Uh... I graduated and then I was planning on moving back home and then I never did. And then somehow like, you know, five years later, I have a mortgage and a partner and a job. Like there was never a strategy for it. I, uh, I, someone mentioned startups uh, earlier and Malma has a quite robust uh, like startup culture. And I had a friend who I had met like, uh, through the water polo team that I played with when I was studying at Lund and she wanted to leave her job but she needed to hire someone her replacement and so I was just going to do it as a temporary gig and then move back home and then it never happened so it was not planned but I don't recommend that I really don't like I should have had citizenship years ago so I had a very convoluted path so get organized <laughs> if you're going to stay some very good advice thanks and uh, diving in a little bit there as well to something you were mentioned earlier, Renee, uh, we have another question here in the chat uh, asking, what did you all do to learn Swedish? So I think I'll amend that actually to say, did everyone try to learn Swedish? And if you didn't, why not? Or did you feel that it was not necessary? And if you did, what's your advice for those who want to learn Swedish? So maybe I'll open this <laughs> to anyone who would like to share. Since I brought up the Swedish, maybe I can kind of contextualize. Uh, I learned Swedish to deal with my mother-in-law because uh, she she moved she's from Poland, but she moved to Sweden in the '80s, and so we had no way to communicate. She didn't speak English, and she lives very close to us, so like I, I had to do it for family. Um, but actually, um, I've been consulting uh, for Volvo Cars for the last year, and my colleagues have really kind of pushed me to join in on Swedish meetings and Swedish interviews and so uh like I've had an opportunity to like expand uh conversational Swedish that I like I did classes and our my employer offers it as like a company benefit so I still take classes classes twice a week but I've actually like had the opportunity to slowly adjust to using it in a more professional context where my colleagues are very understanding that I don't necessarily have like the professional level of Swedish yet. So. Yeah, that's great to hear. I'm actually going to put a link in the chat here as well for everyone while we discuss this uh, to a website about learning Swedish where there are kind of some uh, resources that you can use from home, but also uh, about Swedish for Immigrants, which is the uh, government funded uh, free courses for Swedish that you can take advantage of when you're here as a student, as well as some other things. Uh, but would anyone else like to, to chime in about why you chose either to learn Swedish or not to learn Swedish? 
Um, maybe I can say something here uh, as well. So I also took SFE that you were talking about. Um, and I found that it was just super nice because I lived on a corridor with a lot of suites um, and it was just so much nicer to be able to sit and know what was going on around me. So even though everybody is super welcoming and would switch to English and different things, it's a it's a different sort of feel when you can finally kind of be able to interact with them in Swedish. Um, and I can't say I ever got to that level, but it was certainly a comfort to know that I had an idea of what was going on, even when something was pronounced that I'd say, okay, I, I recognize that word once in a while. Um, so I think even if you don't plan on learning to become fluent, um, I think it's just such a great experience to have, not to mention that the SFV classes kind of allow you to get out of the loomed bubble that sometimes we are a bit guilty of being in, um, because you take courses with people who are not part of loomed, who work in the area um, or who live in the area, and it's a really nice chance just to kind of meet other foreigners as well um, and kind of build a network outside, um, and certainly a good networking opportunity as well, I can say. So I would encourage people to to try SFE, I leave it with a caveat that it's what you get out of it is what you put in. Um, so it's certainly kind of self-paced and they're not you know, checking up on you all the time. It's the same as your studies. So you have to be quite disciplined if you'd like to get anything out of it. Um, but I think it can't hurt for everybody to give it a go. It's completely free, uh, at least when I was there. I hope it still is. Yes. Good. Um, so I just recommend it's just so much nicer to know what's going on around you to be able to go to the grocery store and not have to ask questions about what's what sort of things. So just to have a basic level is a, a huge plus um, just to feel a little bit more integrated, even if you don't plan on becoming fluent or learning long term. Absolutely. Thank you. And Kevin. Yeah, from my side, I tried from, since the beginning when I arrived in Sudan. It was really tough, but uh, for me, it was difficult mainly because I was just for one year and also the master was pretty demanding. So at some point in the middle of the master, I say, okay, let's stop on Swedish and let's focus just on the readings for, for the lectures. But definitely if you go for two years or one year, go for it. And, and even if you're not going to complete the whole full Swedish um, levels, I would say at least try it because it's very important to, to understand the culture. As, as Alexa mentioned, even going to a, to a grocery store, that's important, but also to understand how, how, how sweets work, it's very important to understand the language. It's the very, of course, the most important part of the, of the culture, I will say. Definitely, thank you. And Cynthia, something to add there. Well, I got, uh, I, I took the SFE, but I think because it's like a voluntary, so I'm not that disciplined enough. So uh, during the gap after graduation and while working, I took the Swedish course uh, from the Lund University because I know that it will be graded. I will get some great certificates. So I, I give more push to myself uh, that I learn like twice, three times a week and also uh, get together with a lot of people from Sweden is also good like joining a lot of organization uh, and communities they speak in a Swedish slang language so it's uh, make me easier to get to know them personally to know their personality and especially when I was in the office I feel like if we are speaking English is more like very formal and professional but then if we can speak Swedish so we have like a very easy informal talk with them during fika coffee break and etc so it helps us a lot but it depends you 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 are kind of people like a uh, voluntary thing it can make you disciplined or you need to get some force force or challenge to uh, to be able to learn more something like that <laughs> Definitely. You really need to, to know a little bit about yourself to know what's going to work for you in terms of the best way to learn for sure. Great. Well, we have another question here in the chat from Claire, who says, for those of you who did your bachelor's in another country other than Sweden, how did you find the transition to Swedish higher education? Is there anything you would suggest doing to prepare for that transition? I think that's a really great question. So I'd also like to open that to anyone who has something to share about making that transition to Swedish academics. Renee. I had a really hard time, actually. Uh, I so I did my bachelor's um, in the U.S. Uh, and and I like was educated in the U.S. and it was it was a pretty big shock, uh, like transitioning to I guess like higher education, but also um, uh, like the, the totally different education system. And I don't actually have like 
any solid advice in terms of like things that you can read. Like I tried to read up about Sweden and educate myself a little bit before I moved. But honestly, the thing that helped me the most was to kind of like uh, falter a little bit and just talk to my professors. Um, the feedback system is really different here. Uh, I think Americans maybe come across a little more blunt. Uh, and so I was accustomed to that way of giving feedback. And so I would get feedback from professors and think that I did great. And then I would get my grade back and, and be disappointed. So it really just helped to be kind of honest. Like I said earlier, the resources are there if you need them. So talk to your professors and be like, I don't understand why. Uh, there's so many international students that I think a lot of the professors, at least in my program, are kind of accustomed to, there's going to be a bit of a learning curve. Um, and so, and they're great in terms of like, you can have an open dialogue and say like, hey, I'm struggling. I don't understand what I did wrong. I thought the feedback was great. Uh, and that that really helped me kind of turn a corner and, and and acclimate. Definitely, and I think one of the the biggest advice that I always give is not to make the mistake of thinking that you're the only one going through something. Because of course, all international students are transitioning. I mean, from my own experience studying at Lind, I can say that everyone uh, has different levels of different things that are a very big transition. And so, to know that you're not alone, and there are those resources, as Renee said, out there to help kind of support you through that process. Definitely, Cynthia. Well, because I came from Asia, I, I think that uh, the typical way the education here is more like a result minded. We focus on the result, how the great it is and jump into the Sweden's like, no, result is important. But the most important thing is the process, how we learn during the process. Like Rain mentioned, the feedback is important. The discussion with the teammates, with the professor is also much more important compared to the grade itself. So. How to adapt? Uh, I think uh, the more projects we get, the more we expose with the courses and etc. It helps me to adapt. And then I I learned from the Swedish education system that we appreciate we can, of course, because we try to okay, working time is working time, studying time is studying time, but you need to have your own life besides that. It can be your self development and etc. So yeah, I try to have more balance in my life. I try to be kind to myself as well, but also to deep dive on the field that I learned a lot because uh, in Swedish, we try to, in Sweden, we try to uh, to do some ideation and whatever based on research and the facts, not only just something like uh, out of our mind, maybe like that. Wonderful, thank you. And Damian? Just for me, as for many, many others, as I heard, it was quite uh, stressful to first to move in and settle in Sweden and then to move out and come back here. So both, I mean, any change, like a major change in life is stressful and you just need to accept it and try to, uh, to, to integrate as much as possible. So for me, it was very useful that I attended the induction weeks, I think they were called for uh, or two weeks, we had some experience from students and uh, and from people who were working in the university and Swedish people. So that was quite useful. It was quite useful that I joined uh, a nation pretty early. So you get to meet people, you get to, again, it, it boils down to being involved into as many activities as possible so that you make make it feel like home. Because in the beginning, of course, it doesn't feel like home, but then as you get involved, as you make friends, as you get uh, as you participated in some activities, it's gonna it's gonna feel like home. And then when you move out, uh, it's gonna be stressful again to come back if you decide to come back to your country. And then the same principle applies. You need to just let time pass and uh, integrate and get used to the things that were happening. Uh, so yes, yeah, just uh, give yourself time and try to get involved as much as possible with many activities to make it feel like home. Absolutely. And I've shared a link in the chat to uh, some more information about the orientation weeks and things. So anyone who's curious about what that involves and how that can help you kind of get settled, you can read a bit more about it there. Uh, but speaking about involvement, I'd love to hear uh, there are quite a lot of programs in Lund that require an internship or a work placement or uh, even perhaps a study abroad experience or something like that as part of the program. So is there anyone who took advantage of that opportunity and in what way did that kind of help you prepare for going out in the work environment in the future? I'll also leave that open <laughs> for anyone who'd like to share. Or if not, anyone. Maybe I can say something. Yeah, of course. Um, 
for me it was very important uh, as i mentioned the past um, the internship i had that opportunity and that's that's uh it's not a minor thing even if you are not uh seeking a job in sweden or or willing to stay in the same company uh the, it's a big opportunity if you if you take it definitely because you will learn a lot from the work environment uh, and e even if you're going to do a research uh, path i will say it's also important because right now it's very uh, at least in the field of innovation it's very important to connect uh dots in the industry and also in the academics so if you just take the academics it's fine but your your research or your work experience will be more uh complete if you kind of match both both things both paths so that was my my experience at least from from my side yeah for sure thank you alexa how was your experience yeah i um i did two kind of internships actually i did one with the uh, loon dover summer where i i did research with the professors i was working with and and for me that was such a valuable experience first and foremost to to get my hands on and see if academia was something for me and um, and to get to know my professors better and the work they do kind of outside of the program so i think it was is great overall just kind of to to get to know them and the work that they were doing a little bit more hands-on and um, and it was a pretty easy way to kind of uh, take the first step for an internship was looking close and um, and then i did a second internship actually um where i was working with um somebody who had previously been in the same master's program as i had and um, so it was really unique because they offered us a lot of internal opportunities with our internships so we kind of had first pick when they offered these different opportunities for us specifically for the master's program because they'd gone through it they knew kind of how we were yeah, taught what we knew so um i think that was something really special and unique is that we had our, our foot in the door from the beginning and um, and for me, it was my first time working with a, a European company. So it was my first time kind of seeing what the work life balance was like, what the, the general professional life was like here, kind of how the, the office uh, dynamics work. And um, so for me, it was a really valuable experience to know if I wanted to stay here, if this was something I wanted to pursue, if the, the office life here kind of made sense for me. So it was certainly helpful when it came to applicable skills um, and certainly from a more yeah, practical perspective, the public health things that I learned. Um, but from a more holistic view, I think it was just a really great experience in general to network and then also to kind of see if this was something that I wanted uh, either academia or if I wanted to, to pursue a career in Sweden. So I'd say don't necessarily think of it just as hard practical skills, but kind of think of it holistically of what you're getting out of it in general. Yeah, that's really great advice. Thank you. And Renee? I think uh, similar to like what Alexa was saying. Um, so we had to do an internship as part of our uh, master's program, um, but it was kind of like you had to seek it out yourself and you could kind of shape what it was. Um, so I think like calling back to the autonomy we've talked about, like that's very much how I've found networking in like the general workforce here in Sweden is like you kind of have to create your own opportunities. Uh, so I ended up working, I did two internships, one with a brewery in Denmark and one with a brewery in the US. And uh, my like personal rationale behind that was if I'm going to be sitting there writing, you know, an 80 page thesis, I'm going to write it about something fun like beer. Uh, but that's actually been a really great conversation starter with employers. Like, oh, hey, I wrote my master's thesis about beer. And they're like, oh, wait, like, tell me more. So like it does have a professional and like very practical applications, but I think like the whole process of like kind of cold calling or cold approaching breweries and saying like, hey, I want to like follow people around and see how they like, you know, do an anthropological take on how like beer, people interact with beer. Like it's definitely a, a weird pitch. And I think that's, I've found finding jobs in the Swedish job market to be very similar. So. It was kind of a roundabout, but very like practical experience in the end. This is actually really fun because now I feel like I'm meeting a celebrity because actually, I don't know if you know this, Renee, but in the program now, whenever yeah. they talk about the cool theses that you can do in applied cultural analysis, they say, and we've had someone who's written about beer before. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard that, that was you. That's pretty exciting. That's me. I'm the beer Great. girl. 
a little applied cultural analysis plug. I studied American students and their uh, their experience paying tuition, so not quite as fun as beer. <laughs> still interesting, but uh, great. Well, we have another really, uh, I think, important question here in the chat, which is, uh, how did you maintain the networks that you built during your time in Lund? Which is always something you want to make sure uh, if you make the make those connections to maintain them. So, does anyone have anything they'd like to share for that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you need to become part of the alumni member and the alumni <laughs> program. So that's a really great way to stay in touch with your former colleagues and to, uh, to, to not lose, you know, maybe connect on LinkedIn or just use the social networks. Uh, but yeah, being part of the alumni network is really, really useful. And that's, I mean, what, what we're doing right now is just uh, staying in touch with former colleagues uh regarding the the professional side staying in touch with your former professors i mean for me i i wrote some articles my, my former professor had a he had a published a journal so i wrote an article for that so it's really i mean yeah just the basic things follow each other on linkedin or see what's going on and then uh, send a, send a message you know to participate in some event or to write an article or to uh, somehow stay in touch. Uh, but yeah, for me, it boils down to the alumni network and to LinkedIn. That's it. Absolutely. And Cynthia? Just to add on, it's good to keep in touch. Have a cold text with your a classmate because they can be the one who lets you know if there is an open position or whatever the collaboration in the future. And also, my former professors also could be the one who becoming my reference for uh, another job. So it helps me even though not only professor, but also my former colleagues, like uh, the one in my previous company who helps me to enter the PhD uh, stage at the moment. So just keep in touch, uh, let them know, just giving like a Merry Christmas or a Happy New Year, like to, to, just to know what you are doing and how how's life there. So maybe that's. Yeah, some great advice. Thank you, and Alexa. Yeah, very practically, first and foremost, add everybody on LinkedIn. Send everybody you know a, a request to connect. There is no question about it. That is the easiest way to just stay connected with people in my mind, particularly in a professional field. Um, and Audrey mentioned something about Fika earlier, which is a very Swedish concept. Um, it's quite fun. It's essentially... I don't think I'm going to put the right words on it. Maybe we'll have our new Swedish citizen uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But it's essentially the idea that you can have um, a, a chat with colleagues uh, kind of outside of a work environment. So it's a coffee break uh, or a pastry during the day uh, just to reset. And I think Swedes, um, Fika is such a huge part of life here. All Swedes participate in it. And um, so I'd say that that's a really unique thing about Sweden. Um, anybody who comes here is part of FICA, even if they leave, I think they still know what FICA is. So I would say take advantage of kind of booking people for coffee chats with FICA. Um, even if you live apart, it can be virtual that you just book them for, you know, a quick online chat and have a cup of coffee together. And use FICA to your advantage, uh, certainly to keep your networks and connections um, to, to book people for a coffee chat uh, during the day if you can. Absolutely. All great advice there. And that's something that even as you're beginning your studies, you can even be already making those contacts, having FICA chats with, with companies that you're interested in and start making those connections early, definitely. Um, and I shared a link in the chat to uh, more information on the alumni network. Uh, thank you so much, Damian, for bringing that up. That is, of course, uh, a really wonderful part about studying at Lund is that you have uh, resources both while you're here. The alumni uh, office does uh, some kind of workshops and, and career advice for current students to kind of prepare you for the graduation and afterwards looking for jobs. But then, of course, has uh, an alumni network with tens of thousands of alumni all over the world who you can always call upon to look for uh, different networking opportunities and things out there. I always like to plug that actually on LinkedIn, if you go to uh, Lund University, like the actual page, there's actually an alumni search. So you can go there and search by program or by country and actually see all of the current alumni who uh, at least have listed on their LinkedIn that they're an alumni of Lund and actually take a look through. So if you really think, oh, I'd really love to work at uh, Tetra Pak, I wonder who's working there currently, you could actually search for Tetra Pak and, and see all of the alumni and see if there's anyone from your program. And that's always an easy way to start to reach out for sure and kind of make that connection with others. 
Great. Uh, speaking of the alumni network, actually, is there anyone here who's had any experience uh, attending any of the networking events or anything since you've graduated? What's your experience been actually connecting with Lund as an alumni? Anyone? Well, hopefully <laughs> more in the future. <laughs> we will see you. Great. Um, and we have a question here uh, for Cynthia, I think, uh, is real, really the closest we're going to get. Uh, someone's wondering how easy it is to transition to PhD studies after a master's program. So I know you haven't started your PhD yet, but maybe you could share if there's anything in particular you're doing to kind of be prepared for that transition or any advice you could give for someone who's kind of in the in-between. Well, I actually I did it. I did not do a lot of preparation since like uh, it's totally industrial PhD. So you need to see yourself whether uh, after the master program, you are into like a professional, you are like more academia or you are like in between. So for me, myself, I'm kind of in between. I don't like to be 100% academia or 100% professional. I want to be in between. So I try to find a position exactly like what I want, but I believe that in Every PhD journey, we need to publish kind of paper, like a scientific articles, like uh, Damien also mentioned about his professor, but also I realized in Sweden, I don't know for other program, but at least in food technology, it's not really, really necessary to publish scientific pub publication. But in my country, in Indonesia, for master degree, we need to do some publication. So that will be another thing that you need to consider because for every PhD application, they will ask you whether we have already publication or not and then have a good uh, connection with your former professor because they will be the one who can give you good recommendation so that's the preparation but I don't know whether from your experience whether it's necessary or not to do some writing articles because I just do like a master thesis writing and then presentation and that's all yeah, so I think it will be very, uh, very different depending on kind of what you study and then what PhD you're going on to. But I would say that all of our masters at Lund prepare you in some way to go on for a PhD, or at least you are eligible to go on for a PhD and we'll have some preparation there. But yes, the amount that you might want need to personally prepare in terms of publishing or doing other things before going on is, is perhaps quite personal. But yes, Alexa, uh, something to add? Yes, two two comments. Uh, previously on your other comment of the alumni network, um, I, I can say that maybe I'm not the best at keeping up with other alums, but I try to at least keep up with current students to, to give them different opportunities of things I know that are open in my company that they could participate in. Um, so I think that's a really valuable thing. Um, and I encourage you as well, if you attend Lund and then you, know, you graduate as well, to, to continue giving back to the university to give different opportunities like the ones that I had when I was a student that different alum had offered me. So I think that's something very unique. Um, a lot of the alums from Lund understand what you can do and know it's a very special place and they have a lot of faith in you. Um, and it's important to give that back as well. Um, regarding PhD studies, I think something that's very helpful is definitely networking with your professors and letting them know early on. And um, I think that you can certainly consider pursuing a PhD at Lund University after if the, the exact field of uh, interest is uh, interesting for you. And um, so I would recommend really getting in touch with your professors, booking them for coffee chats, um, having some personal one on one time to ask more about the research and what they're doing. And um, if you show an interest, um, then I think you're you're almost a bit of a shoe in since you're already part of the internal process and the internal network. Um, so if you're willing to put in the legwork early on um, and show them what you can do and also show an interest I think that it opens a lot of doors um, if you'd like to pursue a PhD within Lund afterwards. Definitely some great advice there. And we're running down with our time. So we just have a few uh, minutes left. So I'd really love to go around and just have everyone uh, kind of as a, as a last statement, share any advice that you would give to a student who's considering coming to Lund. How could they make the most of their experience at Lund? And really what should they kind of think about if they're, if they're either not decided yet on Lund or they know they wanna come, but they wanna make sure they make the most of it. What would be your best advice? Uh, so perhaps we can start with Kevin. Well, I will say, especially if you came from, if you come from Latin America, uh, spend some time before on doing like a short research on the teachers and what kind of lectures or even general authors you're going to touch. It's very important because when you come from Latin America, we have like a different set 
to approach academics. So that will that will help you a lot. And the other thing, of course, Swedish, Swedish, Swedish. And uh, and third one, I will say, try to uh, get involved early on on the extracurricular activities. Uh, so go early to Lund. Uh, be there at all the activities because you will have time for their for that and and then you can focus on the academics. That's that's my general advice. Wonderful, thank you, Cynthia. Well, for me, like uh, if you want to pursue a master degree, try to see from both sides. We are not growing only from the academic thingy, but also as a person. And Sweden has opened a lot of things, especially for me myself. I learned to grow as a human, also try to be kind with myself. I also see that uh, studying is not only studying, go to library, university campus, but also we, we need to make friends. We need to involve ourselves with a lot of things. And exiting from our comfort zone is always nice because you will learn a lot of things with a lot of challenges. So hopefully you can go to Loon and enjoy the weather and also meet the sweet, sweet, uh, sweet Swedish people, I mean. <laughs> Definitely, thank you. And Damian, what would be your biggest advice to give? Okay, so I will end as I started and I started with saying get involved as much as possible. Uh, there are many activities. I mean, uh, I remember being part of a photo contest. I remember being a student ambassador. Uh, I remember, as I said, writing an article for the law review, student law review, uh, being part of a nation, a student nation. Uh, for me, for the faculty of law to get involved with the moot court team, uh, after finishing to become a part of the alumni mem alumni network or to or to do as we're doing now to give advice to new students so just use the opportunities try to stay in touch uh, of course just subscribe to many of the things um, to the the emails of the Lund University to just be in touch and to uh, remain connected and to be aware of what's going on and then get involved as much as possible of course don't be stressed, just give yourself time to adapt. I mean, don't just look for things and what's going on and just try to be, uh, to have a balance, you know, be between being involved and then being stressed. So you need, you shouldn't be stressed, you should be relaxed and give yourself time. But then uh, really as much as uh, your energy allows, try to get involved uh, in many activities. So yeah, that's my, that's my biggest advice. Fantastic advice, thank you. And Renee? learn how to cook. <laughs> it's very expensive to eat out in Sweden. I didn't know how to cook before I moved here. Uh, so that was a skill that I kind of had to learn on the fly. And I think similar to what we've like already heard, get involved. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the university has so many opportunities. But uh, my like thing that really rooted me here was playing water polo for the loon team, not the university team, the city's team. Um, and then I got quite involved in the Melma startup scene. Um, so, I mean, utilize the resources that you have, you know, Sweden's third largest city right next to you and you have the capital of Denmark right across the water. So uh, there's a lot of communities both uh, offered by the university, but kind of very near the university as well. So find whatever makes you happy if that's, you know, throwing a water polo ball around with a bunch of teenagers, because that's most of the kids who play in Lund. Uh, then, then do that. Wonderful, thank you. And Alexa, we'll end with your advice. Um, I think a lot of the great advice has already been covered, but maybe I can say, I think Lund has a super robust international network, which is really nice. Um, but personally for me, I found it quite hard to, to integrate with the Swedes, um, which was something important for me. I wanted to, to really expense experience Swedish life and Swedish culture. Um, so I would say, you know, you oftentimes have to go outside of your comfort zone in order to do so. I found for me, it was a lot easier to meet internationals because everybody was coming from the same place. They just moved from somewhere. They were looking for friends. They they didn't have a network, but the Swedes had one. Um, so if I 
can give advice if you'd really like to be integrated in the Swedish network um, and kind of see what life in Sweden is like for a Swede and be willing to put yourself out there, uh, maybe to go to, to some things that make you more uncomfortable if it's just in Swedish or different things or, you know, have a chat with somebody as you're out with a coffee and certainly step outside your comfort zone. Otherwise, I think you might not meet all the Swedes that you wish. And um, certainly they are known for being a re reserved, maybe in some cases, super friendly, super welcoming, maybe not the best at small chat compared to Americans. So be willing to, to be a bit uncomfortable and, and put yourself out there, I think, if you'd like to really see Sweden for what it is. Wonderful. All really fantastic advice from everyone. Thank you so much. And now we've come to the end of our time. So before I let you all go, I want to call your attention to a last few links in the chat that could be helpful for our audience. So of course, uh, today's event is part of a larger uh, three week event we've been having called applicant weeks. So in case you missed some of our 25 or so odd webinars from the last two weeks, uh, we've had a lot of different events, specifically with program staff and current students of each subject area. So please feel free to check out that link to go back and watch the recordings of those. You also so can sign up for our final events tomorrow, which, as I mentioned, are going to go all the way through the application process, all the dates, all the details, everything you need to know. So if you have any kind of questions about applications, scholarships, housing, anything like that, please feel free to join us tomorrow. Uh, the second link is where you can contact my office. So if you have those questions, but you're not able to join us live in the webinar, feel free to please send us an email and we'll be happy to help answer that. You, of course, have the next two uh, links where you can learn how to apply and go through the application steps on your own if you'd like. And the final link, I think very important, uh, we have a resource online where you can actually chat directly with over 80 different current students and maybe 10 or 15 or so uh, alumni. So if you have more questions and you'd like to talk to some more alumni who are out there uh, using their Lind experience in the world or talk to some current students from around the world, please use that and get in touch with them uh, because I'm sure they would love to share from their experience. But otherwise, I wanna thank our panel so much for being here today. It's been really lovely to hear from all of you about your perspectives and experiences and all the exciting things that you're doing after you've left Lund. Uh, I want to thank our audience as well for sticking with us and giving us some really wonderful questions throughout the session. And I wish everyone a fantastic rest of your day or evening.